<laughs> on and off the accelerator. And of course, my wife, you know, she's very gentle and docile. And I finally, I said, Jacob, stop. He said, what, what, what am I doing? I said, that, <laughs> I said, I can't take that. I said, and you're out here way in the center. Of the, I said, move over to the right-hand lane if you're going to do that. He said, well, I'm, I'm, I didn't realize I was doing that. He said, I'll, I'll try to stop a little further. I said, Jacob, you have to stop it or pull over and let me out. I can't go no further. And he said, well, he said, I'm, I'm doing my best, Papa. I said, why don't you turn on the cruise control? He said, what? I said, that thing on your steering wheel. I said, push that button. Turn it on. He reached over here. He said, ha, wow. I said, what do you mean, wow? He said, I didn't know you could do that. I said, you didn't know you had cruise control? He said, I've never used cruise control, ever. He said, I did not know that was there. That is the coolest thing. <laughs> now, you're probably wondering why I told you this story. My grandson drove that car for I don't know how long and never knew he had cruise control. And it makes me think about the church of Jesus Christ. We're driving around with things we don't even know we've got. We got stuff inside of us that we couldn't imagine. We're the most underestimated, undersold, underrecognized power on the entire face of the planet. And most of us don't even realize it. You lead a great big old Clydesdale horse. Them things are massive. You can lead one of them and put him in a little pen about the size of this room. And there's no fences. Just take one little thin piece of wire that's hooked up to a 110 volt thing and put it around there. And he will not leave that pen because of that electricity. He doesn't realize that if he got a running start, He'd run right through that and never feel the shock or nothing. He just don't know he has that ability or that power. I would to God that I could wake some people up that would say, hey, I'm going to run out of the pen. I'm not going to worry about the little shock I'm going to get from that wire. I'm not going to worry about what people are thinking about me. I don't care what I look like amongst my peers. I am going to celebrate who I am, what I am, and what I'm supposed to be doing. Not one of you in this building did God call you to be where you are so you could be nothing. Not one. Not one. Don't tell me, well, I go to church. That makes me a Christian. I park my car in a garage. That don't make me a car. I tell you, man, all this stuff up here is about to get me confused. I feel like I'm on the stage. I guess that's where I am. Who? Who should be praising the Lord? Now, don't worry about me opening these papers up. I always do this and I never use them. It's like a security blanket. It makes me feel good knowing they're there. Let me tell you who's supposed to be praising the Lord. Everybody that's breathing. If you're breathing, you should be praising the Lord. Well, I don't feel like praising the Lord. Tough break, Sam. You're supposed to be praising the Lord. God didn't call you for any other purpose. He didn't allow you to be born for any other purpose. There is no other reason. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Everything that has breath praise the Lord. Why should I praise him? Let everybody that has breath praise the Lord. Enter in his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. You don't have another purpose in life. If you ever get that purpose down, your family will come together. Your life will come together. You will have everything you need and most of the things you want because you're obeying the first thing that God wants you to do. The first thing God wants you to do is worship him. I would to God, 
I would to God they'd quit building churches on every corner. I saw a new one coming in here today. What was the name of that church down there? Saw one yesterday, Catalyst Church. Man, we got third church on the fourth rock in the last second river. All these new names. Everybody's building a new church. Why? Do we need all those churches? No. Why do we have all these churches then? Because every one of them is trying to find a way to make everybody feel good. We're trying to satisfy. Oh, oh, oh. We're trying to sal- satisfy the palate instead of the soul. We want everybody to come to church and be comfortable. Everybody to sit on the seat, and feel like they're a Christian, feel like they're in the house of God. You cannot feel like you're a Christian if you're not one. I can't build a church big enough or beautiful enough to make you feel the presence of God. But if you, for one moment, will say, "Lord, I'm going to pull out all the stops. I'm going to take down all the barriers." I'm I'm going to forget what people think about me and I'm going to worship you in spirit and in truth and I refuse to do anything short of that. We are under mandate and I don't mean by Fauci or the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is not the Supreme Court. It is a lower court in the court of men. But the Supreme Court has streets of gold and gates of pearl and walls of jasper. The Supreme Court is the Supreme God. We are under mandate from him and him alone. You don't have a choice in the matter. Do you understand that? If you say you're a Christian, you don't have a choice but to obey what a Christian does. How do you recognize a Christian? How do you recognize a plumber? He's not shaking hash browns at the Waffle House, I'll tell you that much. He's plumbing. How do I know an electrician? He's working on electricity. That's that's how I know what his profession is. Why would we take this and make it any different? How do I know that I'm in the will of God? How do I know that I truly am a Christian? By their fruit shall you know them. When I manifest the gifts of the Spirit, when I manifest the fruit of the Spirit, when the world looks at me and sees him, now I know. Now I know. I I want to see that restoration. I know we talk a lot about, a lot about revivals, even though the term revival is not in the Bible. When you revive something, it means you bring it back to life or from unconsciousness. But what we really are experiencing, are going to experience, is what Peter talked about in the second chapter of Joel. Now, Peter in the book of Acts, second chapter, he refers to the second chapter of Joel. That was the only prophet that he recognized. And he talked about a restoration. Not anything new, but a restoration. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. Now, don't let me forget where I'm at. I'm about to take a rabbit trail. Yes, I take rabbit trails. I got in that new car they gave me at the airport yesterday. And my, my son-in-law is way up the ladder executive type guy with Enterprise Rent-A-Car. So when I go there, I get about a 40% discount, and they let me walk down the lane and just pick the car I want. That's pretty cool, isn't it? That's the only reason my wife travels with me. So we walk down the lane, I, could, I didn't know what to get. And I asked this guy, I said, which one you like? He said, man, I like these Jeeps. He said, these Jeep SUVs. I said, well, then that's what I want. They give it to me. You know, you don't have to have keys no more. You just have to have a little black, black box thing. And you, you stick that in your pocket. And then when you get ready to go, they push that button. Isn't that cool? And that's something technology's brought us a long way, hasn't it? Well, let me tell you what happened in 1946. <laughs> they built that old, huh, that old slope back black Ford, 1946 Ford. Was a, it was a fancy car. 
And when you got in it, you didn't have to have a crank. Now, you ever heard the term, go crank the car? Well, actually, that used to mean just what you said. No, that wasn't in my lifetime. Any of you that think that, wait in the basement after church, I'll talk with you. <laughs> because you had to go, now they had those crank cars still around when I, when I, when I was growing up, and I was in sixth, seventh grade, there were people still had crank cars. But about the 40s, they came out, you pushed a little button, <laughs> boy, it fired right up. And then they went to this, and they went to that, and they went to the other. And here we are in 2022. And look what we're doing. We're right back where we started. <laughs> Just push the button. Isn't that something? Aren't we smart? Aren't we brilliant? We say, yeah, I created that. No, you didn't. My grandpa was driving them things. There's nothing new under the sun, folks. Solomon said, what has been will be again. We keep, we keep thinking we're discovering things. We're not discovering nothing. We're just reinventing the wheel over and over and giving it a different name and shape it up a little bit and repaint it and get some fancy lights or something and put on it. And we get all this stuff that's on these cars. My wife and I both yesterday, I nearly killed eight or ten pedestrians trying to figure out how to operate that thing. Finally, my wife said, stop worrying about it. I'll work on it. So I said, okay. So she got over there on it, and it comes up and gives us a message and said, we can't do this while you're moving. Okay, well, good. So we'll just pull over, and I said, we'll find another way. You can't buy a map no more. Did you know that? And what would you do with it if you had it? The way the place is built, it wouldn't do you no good. You'd be trying to read that map. You'd wind up in an insane asylum getting treatment. There's no way you could understand all of that. Now, these guys, oh, they can understand that. Yeah, these, these younger folks, they can do it. Can they boil water? No. I heard him when he said, I don't know what's going to happen. Okay, now where were we? Restoration. Huh? Restoration. See, I used to didn't do that. Appoint people in the audience and let them participate. And I'd get home and my wife would say, you know, you got halfway through a story and never went back to it. And I said, well, I'll call people and let them know what I was talking about. Restoration. He said to them, he said, the palmer worm, the canker worm, the locust, all of the, he names all these, dress, the caterpillar, he said these things destroyed everything. He said they destroyed everything. So here's what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to restore what the canker worm, the palmer worm, the locust, and the caterpillar, everything they destroyed, all the things that they did that were horrible, I'm going to redo all of that. Oh, my God, what a promise. He said, when are you going to do that? It said, after these things, after these things, this is when this is going to, he said, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. You're sons and daughters are going to prophesy. You're going to have a meeting like never before when I restore what you should have had in the beginning. Now here we are. We're saying, God, send us a revival. Uh, get the right preacher, and I'm probably not him. Get the right preacher. Bring in somebody. Get a good musician. You hire somebody. Do whatever you have to to get somebody in here that can make this happen. Ladies and gentlemen, nobody can make nothing happen. You're going to have to make this happen. Revival's not going to start because you brought in the right preacher or you brought in a better musician. Revival will start. Restoration will start. When you get to to the place you need to be. I can't save you. I can't lose you. I can't make you be lost. Oh, God, poor brother Jaco. God, don't let him say anything that's going to run the whole church off. Don't worry. I can't run them off. They got to choose to leave. <laughs> I just built me a little wall, didn't I? I insulated myself. Ain't nothing I can say can get rid of you unless you want to leave. But if you're willing to stay, 
if you're willing to say, God, I am going to surrender all of my control to the outcome. Wait a minute. What is the outcome? I don't know. You don't know. But I surrender my control to the outcome because I trust you and I trust everything you are and I believe in you and I'm part of you and I want to be like you. That's what you want to be like. And you want to be like. And you want to be like that. Don't you? Don't you want to feel the presence of God? I'll just put it in old layman's terms. Let's feel it like a window shade run up and down your backbone. Man, man, pump you up and get you up and get you going. Don't that sound good? You like me? I thought you would. (laughs) James, I met you yesterday. It's good to see you. And your lovely wife, and Ezra and Zion. Did I get it right? You ready for me to sing to you? No, you're not ready? Okay, I won't sing. Her name is Sunshine. That's her real name. How about that? So I had with me yesterday, sitting at the table, I had Hope and I had Sunshine. I didn't have either one of them anywhere else because it was raining and cold outside. But inside, I had sunshine, and I had hope. And I knew that if anything went wrong, Zion was there. And when Zion travails, something is about to happen. And Ezra was there also, and he was ready to say, hey, it's time to put your faith in God. It's time to do what God wants you to do. He's going to give you favor with the kings of the east. God has given us favor. He's given the church of God favor. You didn't know I could preach from your whole family, did you? I didn't forget James. He was one of the chief apostles, so just hang in there, James. I am ready for what we've been talking about. Yes, sir. Talk is cheap. Gas is not. We've talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. We bring in the best speakers. We bring in the best musicians. Build the most beautiful buildings. We got more money than we've ever had. We got finer clothes, nicer homes. We're still talking. We're talking that talk. We're smack talking. But there are some people. There are some people that are called by his name that no no longer wish to be a part of the smack talk. They want to talk about the real thing. Spring, it's good to see you. None of y'all call her that because you don't know her real name. But I do, right? Spring. They call her Renee, don't they? Huh? It's hogwash. Spring. Man, today we got spring in the air. Sunshine. Both of them are right outside. Let's bring it inside. Come on, spring, maybe you and sunshine need to lead us. And we need to have a rally here today. Maybe we need to say this guy's going to be around for eight or nine days. Let's kick this thing off right. Let's don't have to work a week before we can get to a place to where we feel the presence of God. Let's don't wait for somebody to go get God and bring him in. God is in here right now. God came here before you ever got here. God never left this place. In fact, there is no, God don't go anywhere because he can't leave. He's everywhere. He inhabits all space. Is this a pep rally? No. It's a reminder. God, remind me of who I am. Remind me. Do you remember when you received the Holy Ghost? You remember it? You remember it, Jay? When you received the Holy Ghost? This Daffron guy. You remember when you received the Holy Ghost? You remember when you received the Holy Ghost? Kulabalis, two of them. I remember everybody. Don't start on this old folk business with me. <laughs> I remember these guys. How old are you now? 15. I remember when you was born. I was here before you was born. I don't mean on earth. I mean in this church. I was here before you was born. I was here before you was born. And I was here before you was born. And you, and you, all of you, before you was born, we don't need to talk about it 
no more. We need to remind ourselves. Close your eyes, Jay. Come on. Help me out here. Now, just think of when you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, how you felt that night. Just think about that for a moment. Think about that for just a moment when you received it. Try to remember. Try to just focus in on what it felt like, how you felt that night. Come on, some of you others, you need to be doing the same thing. Remember, remember, remind us today, God, of who we are, what we are, where we're going, and what we're supposed to do. And let these services begin right here today that we are going to accomplish the will of God and we're not going to allow ourselves to be distracted or talked out of it we're not going to become fearful and afraid because we're trusting in the mighty name of Jesus Christ to lift us up out of the miry clay to help us get rid of all of our distractions all of our problems and love him with all of our heart our mind our body our soul and our strength there is no other way none there is no such thing as a partial Christian Can't do this part time. What? What are we thinking? What would you think if your wife came in and said, I have some news? I don't know if it's good or bad. What? I'm a little pregnant. Jesus, help us. A little? Son, if you're a little pregnant, you're a lot pregnant. There ain't no such thing as being a little pregnant pregnant you either are or you're not there's no such thing as almost in the church you either are or you are not it doesn't work any other way all of these places they're building if you don't come to him the way the bible says oh come on man let me talk to you now if you don't come to him the way the bible says don't let anybody fool you you are not in the body of christ how do I get to that place? I love Romans 8, 14. It is a defining scripture. You can put it up there if you want where they at. You can put it up there if you want to. Romans 8, 14. They that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. I, I present you a question. If you are not led by the Spirit, are you the son of God? Hello? Where you folks at down here? Son, if Tom Bell was here, he'd have everybody up. He's kind of laying down on me, ain't you? If you're not led by the Spirit, are you the Son of God? No. So I pose you another question. Even these guys can get this. If you got 25 churches in the area, all of them going in a different direction, are all of them led by the Spirit? And there's only one Spirit. There's only one Spirit. How you doing, sister? Has Matthew just driven you crazy yet, or are you doing all right? See, I know all these people. She says she's good, but I read it in her eyes. Matthew, you got to straighten up, son. All of this stuff is a distraction. He can patch up whatever I, I mess up, but I'm not messing nothing up. You don't need 150 churches. You don't need 250 denominations. You don't need everybody saying, we're the church. You need to be here. This is where you'll feel God. Them people down the street, you ain't going to get it there. Wait a minute. Who led us here? <laughs> Who's your leader? Who's leading you? God, the Spirit never led you not to come to church. The Spirit never led you not to go to a prayer meeting. The Spirit never led you not to finance the church. The Spirit never led you to fight and argue. The Spirit didn't lead you to break up your home. The Spirit didn't lead you in the paths of darkness. But the Spirit does lead you in the paths, whoo, in the paths of righteousness. He leads you beside the still waters. He knows where you're going. He knows what's wrong with you. He knows how you feel. Why do we have so many people that are disgruntled hopping from one church to the next? Why are they? One woman texts a pastor. Who texts a pastor to say, I'm not coming back? If you ever get a text from somebody who does that to you, 
You ought to text them back and say, well, when you come out of your backslidden condition, let me know with a phone call. That's the old stuff. I like the old stuff, the old ways. When you find those old ways in Jeremiah 6, he said, find them. When you find them, you walk in them. Why? Because they work. I think we need to buy some shovels. We need to do a little digging. We need to find out where the boundaries are. All those, all those markers that, that, that will direct us back to, to where we need to go. Folks, this is not a game. This is not a game. Russia is serious. They have nuclear weapons. The man with the, with the control of the button is as maniac as the guy we've got in the United States. I named them. I named both of those men. One of them is Herod. That's the one that we've got. And that guy over there, he's ready to push the button. And he doesn't care who he hurts. Isn't it strange that right after he got big and cocky, that North Korea started firing some missile tests. Iran now has revamped their nuclear port. Are you paying attention to this? Well, yeah, but we came here to hear about Jesus. Yeah. I'm, here, I'm tired of people telling me, well, I just depend on Jesus. I don't have to worry about any of that other stuff. Stop going to work. Right. Right. Pack, don't even go to the bathroom. He'll clean you up. <laughs> Why do anything? Just lay it off on God. Yeah, God knows. How many times you heard that God knows? You know, you should be doing, well, God knows. Yeah, he does know. That's the problem. He does know, but you don't. You think you know. You think you know. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that way is death. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you that the stage is being set for the return of Jesus Christ. We are on the precipice of a rapture of a church. We better not take that lightly. And while I'm on it, I may as well touch this. We're off to a good start. I'm going to go to the room today and tell my wife, man, I felt good today, and she's going to say, yeah, and I'm divorcing you. <laughs> I'm tired of seeing all these arguments in social media to where we air out our laundry. Who in the name of God is going to talk about having a fight with their wife on social media? On. Well, I was led by the Spirit. Yeah, you were, and I'll tell you what spirit that was if you meet me after church. No, I'll tell you right now. The spirit of the devil because God don't do those things. And they're on social media now. We got preachers on social media preaching false doctrine, claiming it's the truth. And it's some of the people you know. Well, I don't have to worry about all this stuff because I believe in pre-tribulation. Well, good for you. Another one said, well, I, I disagree. It's mid-tribulation. And then another guy comes along. He said, no, nah, post-tribulation. So you having fun with this yet, Brother Jaco? Getting a Sunday school lesson for next week, are you? Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. So I, I talked with some of these ministers, and they said, no, well, here's my reasoning for believing in the pre-tribulation, and here's my reason for believing in mid-tribulation, here's my reason for believing in post-tribulation. Ask your dad to explain all that to you if you don't get it. If he can't explain it, you call me, and then we send him to a class. I believe in the pre-tribulation, so that means none of that stuff is going to happen to me. Not one scripture supports that, but none of that stuff is going to happen to me. We are not appointed to wrath. So when you read about the wrath of God in the book of Revelation, that's not for you. When you talk about tribulation from those bowls and those curses and all of that stuff, them seven vials. No, that's not for you. That's the wrath of God. That's not for the body of Christ. But Paul writes and says, hey, all that will live godly will suffer persecution. See, the precursor to any of those bad things you're talking about is always persecution. We're not going to escape persecution. We're not going to escape it. So I told these preachers, and this other one said, well, we're going to be here through all of it. 
And you know, and then whoever gets out is part of the remnant. It doesn't say that, but it's good. it sounds good on paper. It gets a following on Facebook. And the pre-tribbers, they're saying, well, you know, we're not going to be your friends. I feel sorry for these folks that ain't with us. Yeah, me too. And the mid-tribbers, they're in the middle. They get run over by both parties. That's <laughs> so what happens when you drive down the middle of the road. They get you from oncoming traffic and the outgoing traffic. Everybody runs over you. So I told these preachers, I said, well, I'll tell you what. How about this, this little scenario? If you walk out of your house tomorrow morning and a car runs over you and flattens you like a pancake, your rapture took place right there. You understand that? Everything ended for you right there. So how can I avoid this? So, you know, I, I answer the question. People say, what are you, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib? Mid I tell them, I say, don't worry about any of that. I'm all of them. I believe a little bit of all of them. But I have a better solution. I have the solution. <laughs> That's my picture right back there if y'all didn't know. <laughs> I have the solution. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready for what? Anything. Everything. 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 I don't care. I'm going to serve you, God, without question. I'm not going to do anything. Regardless of what happens, I'm going to serve you with all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my body, all of my soul, all of my strength. I'm going to serve you because I love you, not because I have to, because I want to. So how do I get ready for these terrible things? How can I, how can I know that I'm ready? Well, first of all, you don't want to, I don't care what they say in Australia. This is good stuff. I don't care if you've got a rocket ship in your yard. If that puppy ain't got no motor, <laughs> you ain't going nowhere. So if you don't have the means with which to accomplish a liftoff, you're not going anywhere. You understand that? That's why Paul wrote to the Roman church and said, hey, if the spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, it will quicken your mortal body in that day. If you don't have Jesus Christ inside of you, so how can I know that he's inside of me? That's a good one, isn't it? Okay, we'll see y'all next Sunday and we'll finish this. <laughs> this is why we preach repentance. That should be the, the largest topic we, that we preach. Amen. I like what Matthew Henry said. He said, repentance is so important that should I live another 50 years, I would preach it. But should I die tomorrow, I'd die preaching it. If I live, I want to preach repentance. If I die, I want to preach repentance. Yeah. Why? Because repentance is the relationship that you are to have, if you ever have one, with Jesus Christ. <laughs> Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Right. Repentance is key. So what leads you to repent? He took my sign down. My sign's gone. Computer didn't work at the hotel. <laughs> Except you repent, you will perish. Does everybody understand that scripture? That's a prerequisite. There is, there is, this is not something you can have an alternative. Well, what's plan B? There is no plan B. What's the alternative? There is no alternative. You cannot escape repentance. Except you repent, you shall perish. Well, I'm too young. No, you're not. If you're here listening to me, you're not too young. You're not too old. So if repentance is the first prerequisite, then it stands to reason we should do that. How often should I repent? Paul said every day. But I've already received the Holy Spirit. More the reason to do so. Because you don't want to go back to what you were. 
And the first step back is to quit repenting every day. That's the first step backwards. That's what causes you to say and do things and get involved in relationships you should not be in and get involved in arguments and things you should not be in because re repentance is not a, a solid part of your life. That's why you think something that's awful bad and bless God, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. Boom, that repentance kicks in and before it ever is verbalized, you're already repenting and that's what keeps you from running the wrong way. Man, this is so easy. The Bible said it's so easy that a fool, though a wayfaring man, need not err therein. The second part of it, when Peter's talking about it in Acts chapter two, he says, repent, number one, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. There's no argument over baptism. We know that it's, it's, there's no other way to do it except by immersion. Nobody ever in the Bible was baptized any other way. There's no scripture for that. It's, it's, it's really a ridiculous argument. So it means immersion completely under the water. You can't sprinkle somebody and say, I baptized them. You can't do that. It means to duck under, get them under the water. Why? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, and it's important what you say. See, words have power. They have power. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for for, that's the big word in this whole sentence, for the remission of sins. That means once you do that, your sins have been paid for, remitted. What does it say when you get this bill and it says remit? You, you got, that's payment. He says when you're baptized in water, immersed in the name of Jesus Christ, those sins are now paid for. Now what happens? That means you are now in a position to say, Lord, I want you to live inside of me so I can have that ignition power that will take me out of here when you come back. I, I will now have you living inside of me. And thus, the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes I asked the lady one night, I said, ma'am, do you have the Holy Spirit? She said, yes. I said, when did you get it? She told me whatever the time was. She, I said, how did you know you had it? She said, well, I didn't. I said, you didn't know you had it? No. I said, what were you doing? She said, well, I was doing, wasn't doing anything. I wasn't praying or nothing. It just snuck up on me. <laughs> and I wanted desperately to say, but it, I wanted to tell her, no, ma'am, it snuck right past you because it didn't sneak up on you. And I so... What happened to you? Did anything? Well, no, nothing, you know. I felt better. I just felt clean. Well, I can, I can go in there and throw water all over my body with a wash rag and stuff and feel clean, right. but it's not the same thing as a bath. Right. When you receive this Holy Spirit, God didn't just leave us sitting outside. He said, there is things that will happen. You shall receive the Holy Ghost. And when you receive it, you will speak in other tongues, just like they did on the day of Pentecost. We, we're not creating, they say, oh, you just always own this tongue business. No, I'm just doing what they said to do. That's what they did. That's what the apostles did in the upper room. That's what happened at, at the household of Cornelius. That's what happened in the 19th chapter of Acts. And that's what happened all throughout the book of Acts. They, they spoke in other tongues. It's not something you can conjure. You can't do that. It happens because that spirit over overwhelms you you don't go up there and say okay I got to practice I had a guy do that one night a service I was in it was, it was an independent church and I was there I was sitting on the back row and this guy got up and said now all of you that want you come down here and I'm going to teach you how to speak in tongues and I said check please I'm out of here you can't teach these things you can't teach it stammering lips in another tongue you can't teach that it just happens. It just happened to me, but it didn't happen until after I went through that repentance stage and went through that, that giving my life and heart and soul to God. And when God saw that out, he won't dwell in an unclean temple. And your body, according to the Bible, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God will not dwell in an unclean temple. What God wants is all of you. I wish I knew that song. Why not take all of me? I'd sing it right now if I knew it. That's all I know. God wants all of you or he has none of you. 
That's the program. I mean, I didn't create it, but I stand by it. Would you stand with me? Now, here's the deal. Sound like a talk show on TV. Here's the deal. I want all of you, I have a, I have an agenda. Let me tell you what my agenda is. It's Romans 10 and verse number one. Paul is, Paul is speaking. And, and remember the Bible, when it was written, these were letters. So they didn't have chapters and verses. That came hundreds of years later. They were just one long letter. They couldn't waste, they couldn't waste parchment or scrolls, whatever they had. And so after Paul has said everything that was in chapter 9 about adoption and being adopted into the, to the kingdom of God and so on and so forth, he breaks off onto this, and this is my agenda. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. That's my agenda. I, I came here because I love uh, this boy. He's a man. I don't mean it like that. But he and his wife, I love them. I, I can't even describe how much I love them and their children. And this church, I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. This is one of the hardest churches for me to leave that I know of. Every year when I come and I leave, listen, I cry when I leave because I've become attached to this church and to you people. Every one of you. I know so many of you. So I not only have this agenda here, but everywhere. I want you to be saved no matter who you are. And whatever's keeping you from being in the position or the spiritual arena that you need to be in, I would like to think that this week we're going to manage to get to where you need to be. So that we just start today. And it starts with that one word, repentance. I'm asking you, to start thinking about repentance. Well, I, I pray. No, no, no. Start thinking about real repentance. And if you've got a chip on your shoulder, would you do me a favor and just take it off right now? Maybe put it in your pocket or give it to your husband or your wife or something. But put it down. And next week after I'm gone, you can put it back on your shoulder if you'd like to. But would you just take it off for right now? And say, God, this is my week. I'm going to find my place with you this week. I'm not going to go another day without you. I'm going to know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your sufferings. Here's how to know if we're successful. Is that at the conclusion of this week, you can honestly with a straight face bend your knee to God and say, Lord... Today, I'd like to present to you my body, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, God, which is my reasonable service. I have no ax to grind. I don't intend to be mad at anybody. I don't want to be anybody's enemy. I want a clean slate. I want to know you, God. I don't want anything to stand between you and I. Nothing, 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 nothing. How about that? Should we have an altar service? You decide. You decide. The atmosphere is good. Should we pray? Would it be a fear tactic if I... If I said we're living in a time that we really don't know if there's going to be another service. But even if nothing happens politically, not a one of us in here know what to expect except what's happening right now. It's just not going to happen. 
God, let the atmosphere be filled with your presence. Bind us together as families. If there's anything lurking in the back part of our soul, God, bring it out to the light now. Don't let me leave here, God. Don't let me leave here today with anything in my heart that should not be there. This is the time to mend the fences, repair the breaches. This is the time. Take all of me today, God. Not going to hold back nothing. Not holding back nothing. Nothing held back. Can you do it? Can you say it? I'm not holding anything back, God. This area here is public domain. Doesn't belong to any particular denomination any particular church. So coming to the altar doesn't mean you're joining a church or anything. It simply means you're going to make a sacrifice and that sacrifice is you.